Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people, but in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. That's a powerful, powerful thought. Because if you and I give ourselves in an immoral act with our bodies, we're desecrating that which is holy and set apart for the Lord's use. The world believes it's only natural to express our physical passions, and surrounded by this value system, it's no wonder Christians struggle to follow the biblical guidelines for purity. Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy explains why it's imperative that we follow God's guidelines for our sexuality. We're touching on a problem addressed in one of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. It's part of the series titled, You've Got Mail, and it's available at ktt.org. Here's Philip DeCourcy on When Tolerance Becomes Intolerable. A young man went to the barber shop one day following his haircut. He had a shave and a cute young lady gave him a manicure. And he was attracted to her and so he started kind of flirting with her. He asked her, why don't you go out with me tonight when you get done with work? She said, I can't. I'm married. The young wolf replied, that doesn't bother me. Just call your husband and tell him that you had to work late and then you and I can go out. She replied, why don't you tell him? He's shaving you. (laughs) It's a great illustration of the fact that sexual transgression is a cutthroat sin. It is a sin that breaks hearts. It is a sin that uh, dirties minds. It is a sin that weakens bodies. It is a sin that destroys marriages. It is a sin that uh, cripples children. It is a sin, most of all, that offends a holy God. And it is a sin that, if uh, unrepented of, damns souls. There's nothing casual about casual sex. The forbidden fruit of sexual sin is a poisoned apple. And we've been coming to terms with that, coming to grips with that. We were introduced to that thought here in our exposition of the seven churches of Asia Minor. We've uh, come to the church at Thyatira, and, and lying at the bottom of Christ's controversy with them is the fact that sexual sin had invaded this church, that their moral standards had been lowered, that they had indeed been seduced by a false prophetess who taught them that sexual immorality wasn't a big deal. Jesus straightens that issue out in their minds. He promises to destroy Jezebel and those who committed adultery with her and even to kill the offspring. This is a very serious sin. We see it here in the promised discipline of Christ towards this church. And we have kind of camped there for a while, and we're going to do it again, because this is a a real issue for all of us. None of us are beyond the the reach of the allure of sexual temptation. And uh, we try to get our heads around and our hearts around the fact that, that sexual sin is serious. It's a very serious sin. It has certain costs and certain consequences to it that, in fact, other sins don't carry with them. And we went as an excursion from our text over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I invite you to take your Bible and come with me there, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul outlines the serious nature of sexual sin. Beginning in verse 13, he shows us five things about sexual sin that should remind us Uh, how grave an offense it is to God and how great a danger it is to us. If you were with us, you'll know that we have noted three things so far. When we commit sexual sin, we commit it with a body that's destined for heaven. 
Our bodies destined for heaven. Therefore, our bodies should be a base of operations for God's will and God's work in this world. You and I should keep our body for holy things and heavenly things because our body is destined to be glorified someday in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says here. Just as God raised Christ, so he will also raise up by his, us up by his power. Our bodies are destined to be glorified in the presence of God someday. Therefore, even now, under grace, by the blood of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, let's use our bodies to glorify God now because that's their destiny. Secondly, we saw that if you and I commit sexual sin, we join Christ to our sin. This was an amazing thought, wasn't it? Paul reminds us that, that sex is glue. God intended the intimacy between a one man and one woman to be a bonding event and a bonding experience. And you and I cannot join ourselves to someone casually without in disengaging, tearing our soul apart. Sex is powerful. It's glue. And when we join ourselves to someone else in physical intimacy, we join our whole selves to them. You can't park your soul outside of that event. That's Paul's argument here. And he says, and the Christian must remember, not only do the two become one, but since we're one with Christ, are we going to join Christ to a harlot? No, that's unthinkable that you and I would do that. Then we saw thirdly that uh, sexual sin carries it with it a heavy price physically and psychologically. Physically and psychologically. Sexual sin takes a heavier toll on our bodies than any other sin. It is a unique sin. It is a grave sin. It is a great sin. And with it, there comes physical hurt and psychological damage. Just ask anybody who's had to grapple with this issue. So let's pick up here in 1 Corinthians 6. And let's uh, go down to verse 19. And do you not know, okay, he wants them to know certain things. Here's another thing he wants them to know. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Paul's fourth plea regarding a cross-engendered, Christ-centered purity is that the Holy Spirit has made of us a habitation and a home. What a radical truth. And you have to understand this in the context of that day where you had the temple, this great edifice dominating the skyline of the city of Jerusalem. And up until Jesus came, that's where people went to worship. But Jesus said, didn't he, to the woman at the well in John 4, there's coming a day when you won't have to go up to this mountain or come to this place. And that day has come. Jesus has died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he rose on the third day and he had to leave that the spirit might come. And the spirit has come. And the spirit of God has come to make a home and a habitation of you and me. Somebody should say amen. amen. God has made us his residence. That's a powerful, powerful thought. See, Paul is snowballing here in his argumentation. A Christian's body belongs to the Lord. He told us that in verse 13 and 14. A Christian's body is a member of Christ's body. He told us that in verses 15 and 16. And now he's saying, and a Christian's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are no mere Christians. You and I are the temple of God. Our bodies are not simply physical shells. Try and remember that your body is not a physical shell or a set of clothes. It's a sacred edifice. And what's true of the church as a whole? Because Paul describes the whole church in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 as the temple of God. So it's true of the Christian individually. You and I need to kind of keep this in mind. There needs to almost be a wow factor when we meet another Christian because God has made of them a home 
I don't know about you, but I've visited some spectacular homes in my lifetime. I've stood outside Buckingham Palace in London. I have uh, stood inside John Knox's home in Scotland. I have stood on the door of John Calvin's home in France. I've taken, like you have, the Hollywood Stars tour. This last year, I was at the Biltmore Estates in North Carolina, one of the biggest homes in America built by the Vanderbilts. And what an edifice. And I myself, I know you don't believe this, but I have stood inside the Oval Office in the White House. I've visited a lot of big homes and important places. And yet I've tried to remind myself, just as I thought about all the places I've visited, that actually the Bible says here that... Um, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. And every time I meet a Christian, when you and I talk to each other and engage each other, there needs to be a wow factor because I'm looking into the eyes that are really windows into the soul of a man who's in union with the Spirit of God. That's a fantastic thought. That's a revolutionary, radical thought. The temple of God in Jerusalem is no longer the structure in which God dwells. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. You know, people like to go and visit holy sites. You're a holy site. When you stand somewhere at sacred ground, because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, that's powerful. And that reminds you and I of a profound implication which Paul makes here in the context of sexual immorality. Sexual sin, write this down and think about it. Sexual sin is desecration. Sexual sin is desecration. Because if you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we're a holy site, we're sacred ground, we're indwelt by, by God, God's Spirit, then when you and I give ourselves in an immoral act with our bodies, we're desecrating that which is holy and set apart for the Lord's use. Sexual sin is sacrilege. It's taking the holy and profaning it. Fornication characterized the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love in Corinth. But you know what? Sexual immorality should never take place in the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because you are the church and your body is the temple. And sexual sin is an act of sacrilege and desecration. And I think sometimes we forget that. Sexual sin is an abuse of God's property. Our body belongs to God and to our spouses if we're married, not to anyone else. That's his fourth argument. Here's the fifth argument. It's a kind of piggyback of this one. For you, verse 20, you were bought at a price and therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Given all that he has said, the message should be getting through by now loud and clear that our bodies are not ours to sin with. Our bodies belong to the Lord. Our bodies are part of the body of Christ. Our bodies are now a temple of the Holy Spirit in this dispensation. Yeah, these bodies are Christ because he bought them with a price. And although Paul does not specify what that price was, we know what it was, don't we, as we read the New Testament? It was the blood of God's own Son. 1 Peter 1 verse 19, we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. We belong to him. We're not our own. Listen, because our culture tells us the opposite. We are not free to do with ourselves what we want to do with ourselves. That's not the issue, biblically speaking. We're free to do what God wants us, which is true freedom. Because the bird was made for the air, and the fish was made for the ocean, and the soul of man was made for God and the body. We were made by God and for God. And true freedom comes in servitude to Jesus Christ. We are not our own. We are not free to do what we want. If we'll do what God wants, but we'll find true freedom. If we do what we want, I'll tell you what we'll find. We'll not find freedom. We'll find bondage. 
We'll find ourselves imprisoned to our impulses and desires. Life is at its best when it's lived according to the maker's manual. We who were originally made to reflect God's image have been bought back after Adam's sin, bought back in Christ, and now we're to take those bodies and glorify God with them. They were made to reflect his image, and now in Christ they have been bought again to glorify him. Our bodies must be instruments of righteousness. And I think you get the point then, right? Our bodies are not ours to give away then in forbidden sexual pursuit or pleasure. We cannot take that which belongs to Christ and join it to another outside the will of God and against the purposes of redemption. See, when it comes to sex and sexuality, you've only got one option, and that is to abstain from sexual immorality and to possess your body in honor. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 and 4. If you're single, that means you keep your body for another. If you're dating, that means you keep your hands off your date because her body's not yours. According to 1 Corinthians 7, our bodies belong to our spouses and nobody else. And what are we doing? Perhaps playing with another man's property. Because many dating relationships never end up in marriage. If we're single, we need to keep our bodies for another. And if we're married, we need to keep our bodies solely for the pleasure of our spouse and drink water from our own well. That's what we read in Proverbs 5, verse 15. And that's simply a euphemism for having sex with your own wife. She's your well of life and happiness and joy, and you're her well of sexual fulfillment and friendship. You see, those who have been bought with the blood of Christ are not for sale at any price because their bodies are not theirs. Their bodies belong to the Lord. Their bodies are part of the body of Christ. Their bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and their bodies belong to Jesus Christ. Five reasons here as to why you and I need to grasp the fact that sexual sin is serious because we commit it with a body destined for heaven. We join Christ to our sin. We pay a heavy price physically and psychologically. We defile God's temple and we defraud God's son. Now let's for a few moments go back to Revelation chapter 2. We've looked at the progression. We've looked at the transgression. Now I want us to look at the aggression, the aggression. And that takes us into verses 24 through 29. Now do you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my words works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And Jesus promises again, that which I have received from my Father I'll give to you. And I'll give to you the morning star. The text now is moving from the thought of transgression to aggression. And what we have in mind here is Jesus' future return. The great smackdown with a world gone wild. When Jesus comes back to put an end of man's rebellion and lawlessness. And, and, and he will deal with the lawless one himself. He seems to be an abridgment of all godless history. And so to the rest in Thyatira, that's those who weren't her children. That's those who weren't in adultery with her. It's the faithful remnant, those not touched by this sin of sexual immorality. Those who hadn't surrendered their Christian beliefs, who didn't hold to this doctrine, and those who hadn't surrendered their Christian behavior and sank down to the depths of Satan. Those who had fought one more round, and as Jesus comes and finds others falling, he finds a group within the church who are not falling. They have not been overcome by the world, but by their faith they have overcome the world. He calls them the overcomers, doesn't he? In verse 26. And to the overcomers, he says, there's coming a day when I will overcome. 
And if you won't surrender your belief or your behavior, you're going to enter into my victory someday. You're going to reign with me. If you don't let sin reign in your body, you'll reign with me in the kingdom. That's the argument here. But here's the point I want us to get. Jesus was saying, look, your present faithfulness and your present fidelity in the matters of, of uh, morality and sexuality, it will lead to future reward. As Jezebel and her litter will pay for their sins, respectively, so the remnant will be repaid for their faithfulness, prospectively. That's what he's saying here. Here's the point. If you wanted to put it in a memorable form, you control yourself now. And someday later when I control all things, you will enter into my reign and my reward. There is no freedom in lawlessness only judgment and bondage. But you make a slave of yourself to me and you will enter into eternal freedom and favor. That's what he's saying here, isn't he? Okay, to those who haven't bought into the doctrine, those who haven't fallen into the depths of Satan, I'm gonna put no other burden on you. Hold fast what you have till I come. Remain standing. And here's how you remain standing. Here's how you persevere. Remember that your present faithfulness, even with the trouble that it brings and the cost that you have to pay, will be worthwhile in the future. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is famous for saying this, I am extraordinarily patient provided I get my own way in the end. I love that quote because that's says something to the Christian, you and I can be extraordinarily patient and we can persevere because we will get our own way in the end. Jesus is going to reign. Where'er the sun does its successive journeys run and we will enter into his kingdom and his reign and it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And when you're before the computer screen or there's a situation at work or you're dealing with a struggle in your heart, remember that. Fight through. Fight one more round because in the end, it will be worth it. The temporary pleasure isn't worth it. The cost that comes round to bite you isn't worth it. But present faithfulness in the light of ultimate reward is worth it. Control yourselves, he says, because someday I'm going to control all things. Our future hope is far greater than any temptation or struggle we face here and now. And Jesus said, great is our reward when we overcome. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and a message titled, When Tolerance Becomes Intolerable. Replay the message on our new and expanded website at ktt.org. There you'll also find new resources to encourage you in your faith walk, like Philip's new So True devotional. Philip, why don't you take a moment and tell us about this? If you long for a deeper faith, this brand new devotional, So True, offers you timeless truths from God's Word in a creative and engaging way. These bite-sized segments not only provide readers with accessible theology, but also meaningful stories to illustrate how Scripture applies to their everyday lives. In it, I will encourage believers through challenging insight backed by ample Scripture to make the seeking of God's kingdom a priority. Psalm 1 tells us to meditate on God's Word day and night. Paul's letter to the Corinthians tells us to bring every thought into captivity. I think these devotionals will help you meditate on God's Word and bring your thinking into conformity to Jesus Christ. And you'll find this online at ktt.org. Thank you, Philip. Well, the Bible tells us that as Christians, we must watch, pray, and always be on our spiritual guard. And at Know the Truth, we equip listeners to do just that through the daily preaching of God's Word on this program and through the resources we recommend. This month, we're recommending a book, Seven Dangers Facing Your Church, to help you stay faithful in a changing culture. It's yours with a gift of any amount to know the truth. Call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Tomorrow, we'll learn how God's plan for moral purity yields the greatest satisfaction in our lives. Join us Tuesday for Know the Truth.
Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.